Hey everybody, welcome to True Crime Paranormal with this psychic sister. This is Katie Weaver, and I am so excited to be bringing you our Tuesday episode this week. It's just me today. I did something terrible. I gave Christy my cold. Maybe it was me. I don't know. I haven't seen her in a week, but she's sick. So I can only assume it might have been my fault. So I'm very sorry about that. But for that reason, I'm taking my lumps and I'm doing the show by myself today. <laughs> I don't think she's mad. Maybe. Kind of. I would be. <laughs> anyway, hopefully she'll be back tomorrow. But we're sending her all of our love and apologies. And uh, we expect to have her back soon. It is Tuesday, and today we're going to talk about a very old case, a very interesting case, in my opinion. This is the case of Bobby Dunbar. I don't know if you guys know this case or not, but I think you'll find it as fascinating as I do. I suspect you will, anyway. This happened in 1912, or this saga began in 1912, went on for a whole lot longer. There was a family called the Dunbar family who went camping. They went camping at a lake near Opelousas, Louisiana. And while they were there, their four-year-old son, Bobby, went missing. It was in the summer. It was very hot. They were hanging out, trying to cool off at Swayze Lake. And at some point they realized that their four-year-old son was gone. And they searched and they searched and they searched and they called out search parties. And a lot of people from the community got involved. Uh, the community really took it as a personal loss. Everyone looked and looked. It turned out that this lake was really a swampy place and it had alligators. And so one thing they did over the course of the next few days is they actually trapped uh, or hunted multiple huge alligators that they dissected to see if they could find human remains in their bellies. No one had anything and that, that turned up no leads. They dynamited the lake in multiple places to see if they could churn up a body. They didn't. All they found was his hat, and it was a ways away from the water, which made them start thinking about other possibilities because every attempt to find his body in the water failed. So then they started thinking, well, maybe he was actually kidnapped because he didn't seem to be in the water, at least to their, you know, the best of their abilities to try to find him. And so they had put out uh, a, you know, a missing persons report to be looking for this four-year-old child with blonde hair and blue eyes. And what the police had said is be watching for a child that mis you know, fits this description that might be with people who don't look like are could be his relatives. I'm not exactly sure why. Lots of people have blonde hair and blue eyes, but that's what they said. So at any rate, uh, eight months later, the family gets a call. There, that there was a little boy found in Mississippi that could maybe fit the bill. So Lessie and Percy were mom and dad, and they were, of course, uh, very frightened and excited. Well, you know, probably didn't want to get their hopes up too much, but at any rate, they, uh, they were, you know, thrilled when the, the, the boy was maybe found. So what they found was a traveling salesman whose name was William Cantwell Walters. And he was traveling with a little boy who did fit the description of Bobby Dunbar. About the same age, blonde hair, blue eyes. Authorities took the boy from him and put him on a train and sent him back to Louisiana. 
when the Dunbars got there, it was a bit of a confusing scene. They weren't sure that was their son. Now, he had been gone for eight months, uh, and a four-year-old grown into a five-year-old, you know, has changed to some degree, but it was, he didn't seem to, depending on the reports, now the media went really crazy with this, and different reports said different things. Some reports said that he cried when he saw those people and had no idea who they were. Another media reports that he yelled, mother, when he saw them and seem to recognize the younger sister. So, you know, it's hard to know on that front exactly how that was uh, received from him. But again, a four to five year old should know their parents, even if they've been separated for some time. At any rate, they, they let them take him home to, a, or take him to a hotel overnight. And she claimed, mom did, Leslie did, that after, Bathing him, she recognized him, they recognized moles and birthmarks and scars that uh, were his. Now, he was supposed to have a scar on his foot that he did not have, but they, you know, explained that away. He's a child, they heal quickly. Maybe it's just, um, it's faded enough that we can't see it anymore. So essentially, the authorities decide, okay, well, case closed. It's Bobby Dunbar. And they send him home with the Dunbars. In the meantime, of course, there is an issue because now we have a kidnapper on our hands, maybe, right? So William Cantwell Walters is charged with kidnapping, with the kidnapping of Bobby Dunbar. And all the while he is claiming that this boy is absolutely not Bobby Dunbar, but is the, his nephew. He says this is the illegitimate son of his brother and a servant that worked for his family. Her name is Julia Anderson. So he says that Anderson gave Walters permission to take this boy with him on his travels just in order to get him out of there and away from the, uh, the family situation. So that's what he claims. And, but the police really just don't believe him. They charge him and convict him and sentence him to a lifetime, a lifetime in prison for this kidnapping. In the meantime, Julia goes to Louisiana and says, that is my son. And the courts there also don't want to believe her. The paper is really, really hard on her. When she, the, the problem is they ask her to identify him and she doesn't do a good job of it either. She also hesitates and can't, isn't quite sure that is her son and then decides, no, 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 for sure it really is. So, this is just a really confusing situation for everybody. But the papers call her a woman of ill repute. They say that she's already had two illegitimate children that died. Basically, they kind of paint her, oh, they say that she's illiterate. They just kind of paint her out to be trash, you know? And yet you've got the Dunbars over here who could give Robert, uh, you know, Bobby Dunbar this beautiful life. and. You know, basically, she has really no way to fight this. She doesn't have any money. She doesn't have an attorney. And basically, the authorities just go, huh, nah, we think it's Bobby Dunbar. See ya. And she goes back to Mississippi without who she claims is her son. And that's kind of all that happens for a long time on that front. So in the meantime... The town, when he comes back, like it's a huge deal. They throw parades and parties and have a day in his honor, and it's this huge thing. And it seems like maybe, just maybe, it can't not be true because people aren't going to accept that. But that's my opinion. So when he turns 18, 
some press get a hold of him because one odd thing as he's a child the Dunbars refused to allow anybody to talk to him. Press, investigators, no one is allowed access to him without them being present. And so when he turns 18, some press do get a hold of him. And he says that he has no memory of being uh, in the swamp, no memory of that camping trip. What he does remember is traveling around with the man. That's what he remembers. So that I think should have been a red flag maybe, but again, you know, it seems like that community, that area just really wanted this to be Bobby Dunbar. So I will say luckily for our kidnapper, he was only in jail for two years, Mr. Walters, and then his attorney was able to get an appeal on some technicality, and they actually chose to not retry him. And so he actually only did two years in prison. Um, but he was still, you know, a lot of people still believed that he was some kind of monster, some kind of kidnapper, right? So at any rate, back up to Mr. You know, Bobby turning 18 and having this interview. And that was about all that happened. He went on and got married and had three children and had a lovely life and died at 66 and all was well. Julia Anderson ended up getting married and settling down and had seven children. Later on, this was the family legend on the Anderson side that these people by the name of Dunbar had stolen one of their children, a kid named Bruce Anderson, right? On the Dunbar side, there was this story that Bobby Dunbar had been uh, kidnapped and stolen from their family for eight months and then was returned. So both families believed that that was what was correct, as you do, you know. That's uh, pretty normal for families to have their own version of events in some kind of family lore that gets passed along, and you would really have no question or reason to question that, right? But then much, much later on, some of the family members started to really wonder about what was really true. So a granddaughter named Margaret Dunbar, as well as another lady named Tal McThenia, they decided to really dive in. So Margaret Dunbar started really hitting small town libraries and archives and courthouses and the Library of Congress and just really gathering as much information as she possibly could because she really wanted to know what was true. She finally reached out to the Anderson family. She thought maybe this would be the way to finally get some kind of resolution. So she made contact with Linda Traver. She was Julia Anderson's granddaughter. So again, they're really standing on both sides of the story because the Dunbars believe that their story is correct, of course, and the Andersons believe that Bobby Dunbar is Bruce Anderson and he was stolen from them. So these two women put their heads together and they do a lot of research together and they share everything they have with each other and they work on it together. And, and it's, you know, it, it is probably not always easy because again, they both have their own uh, bias because of how they were raised and what they were taught, but they start looking. And one of the things that they find that's really interesting is a letter. They find a letter in some legal files between Walters and his lawyer from 1913 
And the letter is called, it's from a woman who calls herself the Christian woman. And it actually was mailed to the Opelousas courthouse in defense of Walters and of Julia Anderson. And the letter says, Dear Sir, in view of human justice to Julia Anderson and mothers, I am prompted to write you. I sincerely believe the Dunbars have Bruce Anderson and not their boy. If this is their child, why are they afraid for anyone to see or interview him privately? I would see nothing to fear and this seems strange. The Dunbars claim that if this had been their own child and he had been gone for eight months, do you think his features would have been so changed that they would know him only by moles and scars? This is a farce. If the Dunbars do not know their child, who has only been gone eight months by his features, why? Then they don't know him at all. Interesting. And that letter rang some more bells for Margaret, and it really made her wonder, is this a farce? Was this really Bruce Anderson all the while? So she asks her father to take a DNA sample. This is Bob Dunbar Jr., Bobby Dunbar's son. and. He has said no a few times. They've already asked him several times to take one, and he has said no, but she's researched a lot. She's got a lot of information together. The whole family's kind of been caught up in it uh, to some degree. Some of them did not like her looking into it, it sounds like, but he finally agrees. So they take two tests. They take his DNA, and they take his uncle's DNA. Member because of course Bobby Dunbar at this point has died, so they take Bobby J Bob Jr.'s DNA, and they take his uncle who would be the brother of Bobby Dunbar, Alonzo Dunbar, and it's out for a while, and suddenly it the lab calls and break the news to Margaret that there is no match. So this is not Bobby Dunbar. Now, <laughs> all of those years, all of those years, he was raised as if he was, and all of those years, his mother was denied him, which is profoundly sad. How did it happen? How could it be that a four-year-old could change so much in eight months that we couldn't be definitively sure of who he was. All of it is just really hard for me to understand, except for that, the bias, right? The bias of wanting it to be true. Confirmation bias is a strong thing. If you have a strong bias, then any bit of information that you get that supports your bias whether it's uh, you know sh shoddy uh, info or not, sometimes that still you would put that towards your own bias, and I think that's what happened in this case. So after all that time, then these two families had to reconcile the fact that indeed, indeed, this was Bruce Anderson all the while. It didn't change a lot for their family. Some people were pissed. They didn't want this truth. They thought she should have just let it lie. Some people were relieved. Now, the man who was uh, indicted for kidnapping this child, well, he died 15 years after he was released from prison. So he's been gone a long time, but at least finally he's exon exonerated too because he was not a kidnapper. He was telling the truth. She was telling the truth. It's one of those cases that A, DNA for the win? Yeah, I'd say yes. But I, it is one of those cases for me that still makes you go, wow, 
we still have a long ways to go. You know, how many other times have things like this happened? When a child was literally taken just because he looked kind of like a kid who disappeared and given to a wealthier family and taken from a poor one. Makes you wonder. But then, of course, the other million dollar question, where the hell is Bobby Dunbar? The real Bobby Dunbar. It's my opinion that Bobby Dunbar died that day. I believe he was taken by an alligator. I just think that they didn't find it. I don't think it's a hard stretch to think that something got a hold of him and took off and there just wasn't uh, anything to find. Obviously, they didn't get a hold of the right one, right? But at any rate, I think that is exactly what happened. He was killed by an alligator. He was drug a long ways away and they never found the right one. And so they just didn't know. But there you have it. That is the mystery of Bobby Dunbar and or Bruce Anderson. Of course, uh, his mother passed long before this information ever came to light. But of course, she knew the truth in her heart all the while. I also wonder, what about Lessie? Did she know the truth too? Was her guilt so strong and her need to bring her son so strong that she was willing to overlook anything that didn't support her bias? What about her, his dad? Was his too? Other family members? I mean, surely people had their doubts. They must have. But they wanted it to be true, you know? So... They made it true. Pretty interesting. So there it is. That is the mystery of Bobby Dunbar. We will be back tomorrow with another case, a Wednesday case. We'll be back Wednesday night with Wednesday night updates. And then, of course, Thursday night for the Psychic Hour and some great pop-ups this weekend. So stick with us. This has been True Crime Paranormal with this psychic sister, Katie Weaver. Take care. Have a great day.